Some of the most prominent criticism of the capital gains tax policy has come from the free market focused Washington Policy Center. Joining me now is president and CEO of that organization, Mike Gallagher. Thank you for your time today. Your organization, specifically uh, Jason Mercier, has been very outspoken, maybe probably the most outspoken person on the opposite side of this policy uh, since the since the bill was passed. What do you think this means for Washington? Well, Jason's been a proponent of our zero state income tax for over 20 years at the Washington Policy Center. So we're a free market think tank. A key part of that free market philosophy is the government taking as little as it can to accomplish its mission from the entrepreneurs and families of Washington State. And Jason's been a fierce proponent of it. And last week on March 24th, we took a setback with the Supreme Court decision that for the first time created an income tax in this state. So supporters of the capital gains tax say Washington has an extremely regressive tax structure. Um, they argue that this tax will only be felt by the wealthiest individuals in the state and that the money will go to provide education. It's going to go towards, towards schools and even uh, child care programs. So what's your perspective? Well, all of those assertions are false is our, our position, and it's borne out by the truth and by the facts. Um, right now, the state has a designed a tax that they intend to only have hit a high income earners. However, those income earners can leave the state. They can also move assets out of the state. And when that happens, the job creation, the innovation, and the other benefits of that investment go somewhere else. And as we said right away when we saw the ruling, why would Washington State be helping Texas and Florida attract the future entrepreneurs of Washington, from Washington State? It's a big mistake. So that, that, that policy is flawed in that way. Second, when you look at capital gains, capital gains is not a constant stream of um, revenue. In fact, it varies with the performance of capital assets like stocks and bonds. And when stocks are down, the state doesn't get the revenue that it budgets for. So it's a very um, weak source of income for the state to, um, to capture uh, as a policy matter. And when it comes to regress re regressivity, um, taxing those who have less, more, that's called our sales tax. And the Washington Policy Center and Jason have been a proponent of a sales tax cut for a long, long time. Right now, our sales tax rate is so high, when you pay that extra uh, 2%, 3%, when you go to, uh, the, to the grocery store for an automobile, for normal goods and services, it hurts the poor a lot more than it hurts the wealthy who are better able to afford it. So all of those arguments have been um, um, refuted. So how do you see the real world impact of this policy then? Is there a transfer of wealth involved that, will, that people will feel? Well, we're already seeing it now. You had Fisher Investments announce that they are going to leave Washington State and move to Texas. Um, and with them go a number of jobs, um, over a thousand jobs that, that could go with them on that move. And that's just the one publicly stated company that's making that decision. Anyone who's in wealth management in this state is looking at alternatives. If you are contemplating starting a family owned business, which at some point in time you would like to sell to give the proceeds to your family, which is kind of the American way, you have to be very careful about thinking about doing it here in Washington State when there's a 7% tax that now applies to that that will not apply in other states around the country. And again, why we're making Seattle uh, uh, create a disadvantage for Seattle to create jobs when we have 34% um, uh, back to work in downtown Seattle, why we're doing that and helping Miami and um, um, uh, Austin, Texas, um, is beyond me. It just doesn't make a lot of policy sense if this state wants to create and attract new jobs. So in the, the ruling that upheld the, the state's capital gains tax, the Washington Supreme Court ruled that the legislature did not create an income tax, but a capital gains excise tax basically as advertised. Is this issue settled? Um, first of all, that opinion, I encourage everyone to read it because it leaves you scratching your head of how an excise tax can be attached to income and not be an income tax. And when 49 other states, multiple other countries, and the Internal Revenue Service all refer to the same exact type of tax as an income tax. But nevertheless, the court went forward and came forward with that 
um, that, that concoction, which is unique in the world, that this is now an excise tax, and it will create significant challenges for wealth creation here in this state going forward. There are some in the tech community, the entrepreneurial community, who have said that, uh, you know, th basically that as a matter of principle, that they support the capital gains tax um, and that, that, you know, employees would want to come somewhere um, with the sorts of creation, uh, the sorts of environments that can be created with funding from a capital gains tax. Uh, what do you think about that? What's your perspective on that? So take one step back, and if you're a tech entrepreneur, you're pretty smart. You've got to be good at things like math. Right now, state revenue is at a record level. It's nearly doubled over 10 years. 100% growth in 10 years. There's more than enough revenue to fund every need in this state. The state does not need this tax revenue. There are all of those goods and services that those tech entrepreneurs might be attracted to will continue going forward. They've been provided to this point without it. It's not necessary to provide it going forward. And so the revenue that the state collects off its existing tax structure is more than sufficient to fund smart government. What do you think is the next step at the legislative level? Uh, at the legislative level, that'll be up to the majority to decide that. And in Olympia, that, that's not uh, anyone who's embracing the free market at the moment. Um, and they have options. The concerns that we have, and we've stated these, is that the rates could change. They could take that $250,000 exclusion and drop it down. And there already was a bill to drop it down as low as $15,000 this year. So this tax that becomes only on the wealthy becomes much more on everyone who has sold stock and made over $15,000. That's the nature of these taxes. Once they're in, the ratchet gets turned down. Also, there's the notion of changing the exclusion amount, um, which right now is $250,000. So those, the tax can be tuned. It's also a concern that this could be ap applied to the same theory that was approved by the court, could be applied to the real estate excise tax, that you could start taxing gains on personal real estate. And these are highly problematic. Those create even more of a headwind. And as uh, Jason Mercier, who again works at the Policy Center, in February of 2021, he interviewed a tech entrepreneur who said every time that the state talks about raising taxes, it's, it frightens away future businesses. And we're not just talking about it now, it's happening on April 18th. There was an initiative campaign to repeal the capital gains tax that was launched and then suspended before, really, it even got to the signature gathering phase, I believe, certainly before it was certified. And so organizers said it, it was halted pending the outcome of this uh, lawsuit. And there, but there was reportedly polling that suggested the initiative uh, may be unlikely to pass. Now, a new law requires all tax repeal initiatives to list the budgetary impact on the ballot. Do you think voters would reject this tax if it were on the ballot? Voters in this state are incredibly smart on this issue. Ten different times an income tax has been on the ballot, and ten different times it's been rejected by differing margins, most recently um, by nearly 60-40 um, opposed to the creation of an income tax. We are quite confident, I'm confident, I wouldn't have moved back here uh, from Virginia, which is a relatively moderate tax state. I wouldn't have moved here if I thought that there would be a realistic possibility that the people of this state would embrace a new income tax. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic that um, we're turning the page, we're starting a new chapter, and from the Policy Center perspective, our perspective has not changed. We are for a zero state income tax, which is in our Constitution, and that is within the reach of the people to take that back. Uh, with one of the plaintiffs in the challenge, the Freedom Foundation, uh, they issued a press release about the, about the ruling, saying that the organization's already laying the groundwork for a, a challenge and that, you know, basically they would appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Do you see that happening? Well, uh, first, Rob McKenna did a fantastic job um, representing um, the side of, of entrepreneurs, investors, and the heritage of our state and our Constitution with zero income tax. He did a great job. There, is, uh, there are two different angles of federal appeal. One is to appeal directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. The other is what's called the Dormant Commerce Clause. It was an argument raised in the case uh, to elevate that to the federal court and pursue that. 
Both of those are problematic for different reasons. One, the U.S. Supreme Court takes very, very few cases. It gets to choose um, which cases it, it would like to hear. Um, that, 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 that one's a reach. It's not impossible. Um, the, this case is so unique in the sense of creating an excise tax out of thin air that there could be interest. That, you know, that, that, that could be one viable path. And the other on the Dormant Commerce Clause, that would be just another federal case which takes a long period of time. In the meantime, you have the chilling effect of this tax uh, setting into our economy here in Washington during a time of high inflation and during a time of high economic uncertainty. And, and that would continue during the pendency of that case. So those, are, those are each have their challenges um, when it comes to actually solving our problem. I'm afraid we're out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much, Mike Gallagher, President and CEO of the Washington Policy Center. We appreciate your perspective. Enjoyed it. Look forward to coming back. Thanks for watching. Please join us next week for more in-depth interviews you won't find anywhere else. Have a great week.